Right now, if you had to define your life in one word, what would it be? Hectic? Fun? Crazy? Overloaded? Overwhelmed? Stressful? How many of us, if we had to define our life in one word, would use the word centered? Centered. The result of centering your life is centered relationships that are unshakable when the earthquakes of life strike. How do you have a centered life? You follow the first two commandments in the Ten Commandments. So would you stand in honor of God's word and let's look at Exodus chapter 20 and just follow along with me. These are the first two commandments and they go together. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water underneath. God says, I demand the center of your life. And if you put anything other than God at the center of your life, then it becomes an idol. If I substitute anything other than God as first place in my life, it becomes an idol. And even good things that God created for our enjoyment, we said last week, can become idols. We don't have idols of stone and wood and gold and silver like they did in ancient civilizations, but we still have our idols nonetheless. Can a career be an idol? Sure. Can sports be an idol? You bet. You know, there's so many things that are good that, become, that can become an idol in our lives. It all depends on what's at the center of your life. If anything other than God is at the center of your life, then there is an idol there in your life. I want you to think of your life like a wheel. And in the center is the hub, the core. And that's the most important part. That's where all the power comes from. And then you have the spokes of life. And the spokes would be things like, if you're married, marriage, family, work, hobbies, dreams, goals. Those are the spokes of the wheel. Your relationships, the spokes of the wheel. And if you allow one of those spokes to become the center, the hub, then you have a faulty center. Even good things, if... I allow my marriage to become the center of my life, then that's an idol. Anything that you substitute for God at the center of your life becomes an idol. And an idol is a faulty center to build your life on. One of the first things that begins to happen when we move anything other than God into the center of our lives is a loss of control. When you have a faulty center, your life begins to spin out of control. The amazing thing is you think you're controlling everything. You think you're making the choices. You think you're doing what you want to do. It's like, I'm not going to follow God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. No one's going to put their rules on me. I'm going to live by my rules. I'm going to do what I want to do. And the problem is idols begin to control you. The reason why God says no idols is because he knows that whatever is at the center of my life will control my life. He knows how important the center of your life is because you will build your whole life around the center of your life. And if anything other than God is at the center of your life, then it will start to control you. Idols control us. It says in Psalms 115, 8, those who make them idols will be like them and so will all who trust in them. You'll start to become like whatever you put your trust in. You will start to become like whatever is at the center of your life. You will gravitate toward your God. You are made to worship. You are created to worship. And God created you to worship him by putting him at the center of your life. But if you don't worship God, you will worship something. You will put something at the center of your life. You were made to have something in the center of your life. You always have something at the center of your life. So what is your life revolving around right now? Is it work? Is it family? Is it that dream? Is it that goal? Is it that relationship? 
What is your life revolving around right now? If it's revolving around anything other than God, you have a faulty center and eventually things will spin out of control because that idol, even if it's a good thing that you've put at the center of your life in place of God, it becomes an idol. And eventually it controls us. That's why God says, put me at the center of your life because I will be in control of your life. And I love you more than anyone else. I care about you so deeply and have the power to make a difference in your life, to give you provision, to watch over your life, to balance your priorities. You see, the spokes of the wheel come into balance when I put God at the center of my life. That's why Jesus said this in Matthew 6, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. See, if God is at the center of your life, all the spokes begin to fall into place. He says, I will balance your priorities. I will provide for your needs. I will center your life so it's unshakable in the shakiest times. Now, the problem is when it comes to the spokes of the wheel, usually what we do is we have our relationship spoke and those of you who are married, the marriage spoke and the work spoke and goals and dreams, hobbies, of course, family. And then we give God a spoke of the wheel of our lives. And we say, God, you get a slice of the pie. So I'm doing pretty good. God, you're in there. You know, you're just as important as my hobbies. I just want you to know. Generally, that's what most people do. They'll say, you know, they'll say, you know what? I, I really want God to be first place in my life, so I'm going to give him a slice of the pie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let God have his portion in my life. He's going to get a spoke of the wheel, and God says, I don't want a spoke of your wheel. I demand the center of the wheel because that's where all the power comes from. If God's not the center, you have a faulty center, and you have no power to make it through the pains and the difficulties of life. Storms come into every life, and if you don't have God at the center, then you don't have a hub that's strong enough to power you through when the pressure's on. But God says, I want to be at the center of your life. And so, do you see how that works? God's at the center of every area. He's at the center of my relationships, the center of my finances, the center of my marriage. He gets first place. He gets the first part, the first place in every area of my life. God says, I want to be first in all the important areas of your life. Now, there are three idols in the scripture. We briefly mentioned them last weekend. Three idols that uh, the people tended to fall into worshiping over and over again. Three main idols. There was Mammon, the god of money and success. There was Baal, the god of sex and pleasure. And there was Molech, the god of selfishness and violence. And so I want us to Look at these same three idols today because I believe these are the same three idols that people worship every day in our modern society. First is the God of mammon. And by the way, it's God with a little g on these gods. It's the God of money and success. And look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Underline the last phrase. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now Jesus wasn't saying that there's anything wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with financial success. There's nothing wrong with material possessions. It's just when you try to put them at the center of your life, they move from being treasure to being mammon. When you do something with what God has given you to make a difference in the lives of others, to do something for all eternity, then it's eternal treasure. And God says it's okay to lay up for yourselves treasures. And Jesus didn't say it's really bad to have treasure. No, he just said it's really stupid to put it all down here on this earth. That is not long-term investing. That's short-sightedness when you're down here just a few short years, 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and then eternity is billions upon billions upon billions upon billions, and, and then it's just begun. It, it's, he was just saying, 
hey, you really ought to invest, invest wisely. Don't invest for the next year. Don't invest for the next 20 years. Don't invest for the next 100 years. Invest for the next 1 million years. Think ahead. He's saying here, there's nothing wrong with finances. There's nothing wrong with success here on this earth. It's just when it becomes the center of your life, it gets destructive immediately. And you can't have God at the center of your life if money and possessions are at the center of your life. So how do I make Christ the center of my finances? Well, Jesus told a parable about a man who was me-centered in his finances rather than God-centered. And that's what it all comes down to. Am I going to be me-centered or God-centered? If I'm me-centered, then my life's going to spin out of control. If I'm God-centered, then my life is unshakable. So this man was me-centered. And here's what he did. In Luke, I want you to look at it with me, chapter 12. It says here, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my crops and grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Now, here's what I see here. This guy used 11 personal pronouns. He said, I will do this. I will build this. I will store this. I will do this. This guy had an eye problem. That was his disease. It was egonomics. He had an eye problem. It was all about him. And I want you to underline the phrase at the very beginning, the ground of a certain rich man produced. The ground produced it. God produced it through the ground, not the rich man. He said, I'm a self-made man. Look what I've done. Look how amazing I am. And it just keeps coming in. So I'm just going to build bigger barns and I'm just going to build a bigger bank account and I'm just going to do all these things and all this investing and all this building and I'm going to do amazing things because I'm amazing I'm a self-made man. I've worked hard to earn all this. I'm just going to live it up now. And God said, you fool. Don't you understand that everything you have comes from me? Everything. Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you your very life and health? And who gave you your very breath? And who's going to take it away tonight? You fool, tonight you're gone. Tonight you leave it all behind for your kids to fight over and for the government to take a lot of it. Tonight, it's over with. You see, this guy didn't understand that it all comes from God. I don't think Jesus was saying that it was wrong for him to be financially successful. In fact, I know Jesus wasn't saying it was wrong for this man to be financially successful. What he was saying was, this guy didn't appreciate where it came from. And this guy didn't give any of it back. And so you're rich, but don't feel guilty about it. Just do two things. If you want to make sure that you're God-centered in your finances, and we're talking about the toughest one first, because when we put God first in the practical areas of our lives, you know, I just don't want to say, hey, put God first, and it's going to be wonderful. Just put God first. Everybody, let's just put God first. And you go out and go, yeah, I'm putting God first. No, God says, I want to be first in the important areas of your life. And God knows finances are important to us. And if God's not first in this area, then we might as well just go home. And because this is the tough one, so let's deal with the tough one first. So number one, acknowledge that it's all from God and be grateful. Enjoy what God has given you. Enjoy it. It's all from God. Secondly, give back that first 10%. You give back the first 10% to put God at the first place in that slice of the pie. You give God the first 10%. That's why scripture says in... Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. Underline the first part of all your income. Not the leftovers. Not if there's anything left at the end of the month. The first part of all your income. And then Deuteronomy 14, 23 says, Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, 
and the firstborn of your flocks and herd. The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. And Jesus confirmed this passage. And it's important for us to understand what the tithe is. The word tithe just means 10%. Nothing mystical or magical or spiritual about that. It just means a tenth, 10%. Now, why did God say 10%? Why didn't God say 5%? Or why didn't God say 20%? I don't know. I don't know, but he said 10%. But I do know the purpose behind it. Underline it. It's the very last part of that last verse. The purpose of tithing is what? To teach you always to put God first in your finances? No, in your lives. In your lives. The purpose is to put God first. Because God knows if he's first place in the important areas of your life, he's first place. If he's not first place in your finances or in your relationships, he's not first place. It's as simple as that. Well, let's move on from the God of mammon. He's probably the biggest God that we all struggle with, that people struggle with today. But here's another one that we all struggle with today. Baal, the God of sex and pleasure. Baal was the fertility God. And there were temple prostitutes, all kinds of vile things in Baal worship. It was all about fulfilling your fleshly indulgence, doing whatever you just feel like doing. And there were no rules, no boundaries, except when you would get into Baal worship, the more you would get into it, the more Baal supposedly would demand of you, and it would become very destructive, self-mutilating. The prophets of Baal would cut themselves to show how much they were dedicated to Baal. And it was very destructive. It's amazing. It was like, it was all about being free to do whatever you want to do, but it's like any idol. Then you're caught, and you're not free anymore, and it's destructive. Now, when it comes to God's gifts, there are always boundaries. And let me just say this. We're going to talk more about sex in this series. But sex is a gift of God. It's a beautiful, wonderful gift of God. It's not bad. It's not dirty. It's not wrong. It's a beautiful, sacred gift of God for our enjoyment in the marriage relationship. There's boundaries on it. It's within the bounds of marriage. And it's like any of God's gifts. If you break God's rules on relationships, it comes back to hurt you. You don't break God's law, God's law breaks you. It's like fire, one of God's gifts. In the fireplace, contained in those boundaries, it warms you. Outside the fireplace, it can burn the house down. It's destructive, and that's the way it is with sex. God says, my rules for what I created for your enjoyment, this powerful, amazing gift, is to bring unity and oneness and enjoyment and pleasure in the marriage relationship. And so you shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's not bad. It's not dirty. But it's reserved in the boundaries, the powerful boundaries of marriage. Before marriage, outside of marriage, it's destructive because it's not just a physical act. It has deep and profound spiritual and emotional ramifications. And it's very destructive emotionally, spiritually, sometimes physically. But when we follow God's rules for relationships, there's blessings. Outside of God's rules, it becomes lust. And lust is all about, I want what I want when I want it. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to follow God's rules. I'm not going to do it God's way. I feel like doing this. And if it feels so good, how can it be wrong? And so I'm going to do what I want. That's lust. Lust is all about taking. Love is all about giving. Love says, I'm going to take what I, lust says, I'm going to take what I want. Love says, I'm going to give. And let's look at the next idol, Molech, which you can wrap all the other idols into. It's the god of selfishness. It had the head of a bull and the body of a man. And in the middle, there was a hollowed out place in this idol where they would burn a fire. And then they would put their children in the fire, usually the firstborn. And this is where they would sacrifice their firstborn children, their children to this god Molech, this god of selfishness. And talk about the ultimate selfishness. They thought if they sacrificed and burned their children in the fire to Moloch, then Moloch would bless them and they'd have a great life. They might be famous. Everything might go really well, be successful, and everything work out. Can you believe that? The ultimate act of selfishness, sacrificing their children. You think of Christ, the ultimate sacrifice when he gave his life, but the ultimate act of sacrifice was Christ's sacrifice. The ultimate act of selfishness was sacrificing children to Moloch, and, and we would say today, well, that's horrible, that's heinous. We would never do that. And yet I see men and women sacrifice their children every day to the God of a bigger bank account or a bigger house or more success at work. 
and they're never there for their kids, sacrificing their kids each and every day to the God of selfishness. I, I see men and women sacrifice their children at least once or twice a week. I see someone or talk to someone who has committed an affair, committed adultery, and it destroys the whole family. Why? Because they felt like it, because it felt right. But it did destroy the family and their kids. I see people sacrifice their kids each and every day to the God of selfishness. I see a lot of parents who never put God first at the center of their life, and so everything else is more important. Um, you know, the, the sports activities of their kids, all the lessons of their kids, uh, everything else sleeping in on the weekend, everything comes before God. And their kids know that and they sacrifice their kids on the altar of selfishness. And their kids realize that Christianity doesn't mean anything. It's just something you talk about, but you don't really do. See, I want to break it down to something that really helped me years ago when someone showed me this. This circle represents a non-Christian. And this is the throne of your life, the center of your life, the captain's chair of your life. And for a non-Christian, it's me, it's, it's I at the center calling the shots, playing God, and then Christ is outside. And then all the priorities, these little dots represent priorities, are all misaligned. They're all out of whack. And so then you see over here someone who's a Christian. But someone who has Christ inside their life, they've invited Christ in their life, they've surrendered to him for salvation in heaven one day. But it's so easy for us as Christians, for Christ followers to push Christ off the throne of our lives and start calling the shots again. And when that happens, the results are the same as if we weren't a Christian. Our priorities spin out of control, get all out of balance. But here's what God wants. God wants me to be a God-centered believer where God Jesus Christ is on the throne. And I push me off the throne and let him be God in my life. And when that happens, he lines up my priorities. He balances my life. He centers my life. He provides for my needs. Centered only comes from letting God be at the center of my life. And that's a daily battle for Christ followers because we so often try to push God out. How do you know if you push God out and you're on the throne? You start to worry and you try to control things. Man's oldest problem is trying to control. Don't ever forget that. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of God. I love this passage, but underline nor idolaters. He, he's saying all sinners who've broken the Ten Commandments aren't going to get to heaven because heaven's a perfect place for perfect people. Idolaters aren't going to get to heaven. It's a perfect place for perfect people. Well, that's a problem for us because we've all committed the sin of idolatry. We've all put me at the center of our lives. And that's a problem for us because nobody's perfect. We've all sinned. And that's why Jesus came to the cross. You see, we've all broken the Ten Commandments and we're all broken because of it. But if you take your brokenness to the cross, you find blessedness. The greatest thing about the Ten Commandments is that it turns us to the grace of God because we've all broken them. And we're gonna see every one of us has broken every one of them because Jesus said, even your motives come into play. Even your thoughts come into play on the Ten Commandments. And, and so basically, he said, every one of us have broken the law and that's why we're broken. There's so many broken hearts, broken lives, broken relationships, broken emotions, broken minds today. We live in a broken society, in a broken world because we've all broken God's laws. That's why we gotta get back to God's laws. But first, you gotta go to the cross.